Hi there, this is Physio Paul, your YouTube tutor is here to present a new topic to you all, my viewers. That is, motor unit. Motor unit. Definition of motor unit. A combination of a single motor neuron and all the individual muscle fibers it innervates is termed as a motor unit. Not to confuse motor unit with motor point. Anatomical definition of motor point, it is the spot where the motor nerve axon enters the muscle. Generally, this point is spotted at the junction of proximal one-third and the distal two-thirds of the belly or the fleshy part of the muscle. Electrophysiological definition of motor point, it is the spot on the skin surface over the muscle belly, where strongest muscle twitch can be obtained with minimum current intensity. Hope, you all are out of confusion now. Okay, now let's get back to the topic, motor unit. The number of muscle fibers supplied by a single nerve fiber varies. Very few fibers are there where low force but precise control of movement is required. The number of muscle fibers supplied surges up to 1 or 2,000 for large postural muscles which must produce large forces. An individual muscle is made up of many motor units which can be fast fatigue or fatigue resistance, giving the muscle its particular characteristics. All fibers in a particular motor unit are the same type but the proportion of different motor units, hence fibers, varies between muscles. Now, we are going to discuss about different types of muscle fibers in brief. Muscle fiber types.
recruitment order of muscle fibers involuntary and electrically induced muscle contractions and the factors controlling this recruitment. In the last two of previous slides, we've got to know that small diameter nerve fibers are activated first followed by large diameter ones, hence slow twitch fatigue resistant fibers are recruited first in muscle activity, followed by fast fatigue resistant fibers type 2A and fast fatigable fibers type 2B respectively. This is Henneman's size principle. Muscle fiber recruitment order follows this principle only during voluntary muscle contractions. So, the main factor controlling this muscle fiber recruitment in a voluntary muscle contraction is the diameter of the supplying nerve fiber. The scenario is completely opposite when it comes to electrically induced muscle contraction. When nerve fibers are activated by transcutaneous electrical stimulation, the order of nerve fiber recruitment does not follow the size principle of Henneman. Muscle fiber recruitment in electrically induced muscle contraction. First factor controlling it is supplying nerve fiber diameter. Nerve fiber diameter. It is a key factor as depolarization depends on the potential difference between two adjacent nodes of Ranvier and the spacing between adjacent nodes is proportional to the fiber diameter. Larger diameter fibers are bigger in all respects, those have larger internodal distances. And smaller diameter ones have smaller internodal distances. An increased diameter and proportionally increased internodal distance will result in a larger potential difference between two adjacent nodes when current passes through tissue. Here arises a question, that is, why does fast fatigable fiber, type 2B, consisting motor units get recruited first in muscle contraction while comparatively low intensity electrical stimulus is applied? Answer to this question is, the nerve fiber with larger diameter and longer internodal distance become easily excited due to larger potential difference between two adjacent nodes. Sensory and motor responses, involving relatively large diameter fibers, are generally evoked at lower stimulation intensities than the pain response associated with stimulation of smaller diameter fibers. Here lies the cause why fast fatigable motor units will be recruited at lower stimulation intensities than slow, fatigue resistant motor units. Second factor is proximity of the nerve fiber to the electrodes. Nerve fiber diameter is not the only factor determining recruitment. Proximity to the to the electrodes is also important. It is a factor because current spreads through the underlying tissue volume, so the effective stimulation intensity decreases with distance from the electrodes. This means that there will be a zone of effectiveness under each electrode where stimulation is maximum. Outside this region, recruitment will diminish as a lesser proportion of the fibers will be excited. At a sufficient distance from the electrodes, no stimulation will occur as the local stimulation intensity will be subthreshold. So, it is evident that the larger the fiber diameter and the closer the fiber is to the electrode, the greater the excitability. Muscle fatigue. Any form of sustained or repetitive muscle contraction will result in fatigue. So, what is this fatigue actually? Let's bring some light on it. Definition. Fatigue is defined as the progressive decrease in the ability of a muscle to generate force as a result of ongoing motor activity. The complication is that muscle force generation is the end product of the sequence OT chain of events and each step in the sequence has the potential to contribute to fatigue. Those events are, for normal voluntary contractions, step 1, central nervous system is involved here, resulting in firing of fibers and the peripheral nerves, the alpha motor neurons. Step 2, the signals are transmitted to the neuromuscular junction where the neurotransmitter acetylcholine arc is released. Step 3, binding of sufficient arc to the motor end plate results in an action potential being produced and propagated over the muscle fiber membrane. Step 4. A wave of excitation spreads across the membrane and is transmitted into the interior of the muscle fiber via the transverse tubules T-tubules. Step 5. Depolarization of the T-tubule membrane results in release of calcium ions from the stored reserves in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Final Step 6. Calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin molecules and this binding activates actin-myosin cross-bridge cycling with ATP used as the energy source. 
These are the steps of voluntary muscle fiber contraction and each step contributes to fatigue. Central and peripheral fatigue. Fatigue can have its origins at any of the steps involved in muscle contraction and can be a result of either a decrease in the neural activation of muscle fibers or a decrease in the muscle fiber response to repeated stimulation. These decrements can be usefully categorized as central in origin or peripheral. Central and peripheral fatigue definitions. Central fatigue. Central fatigue is when the average motor nerve firing frequency decreases, either because of a lesser central nervous system CNS drive or because of reduced transmission of CNS drive to the motor neurons. Peripheral fatigue. Peripheral fatigue occurs at or beyond the neuromuscular junction. With electrical stimulation, peripheral nerves are stimulated directly so any fatigue observed must be of peripheral rather than central origin. Electrically induced peripheral fatigue can involve a variety of mechanisms, including an impaired ability to evoke an action potential at the site of stimulation. There is the possibility of impaired transmission at the neuromuscular junction. In a normal voluntary contraction where the firing frequency is low, the amount of acetylcholine released per action potential is far in excess of that required to depolarize the muscle fiber membrane. However, with higher frequency stimulation the limited stores of acetylcholine in the motor axon terminal can become depleted because the time constant for replenishing the acetylcholine is relatively long, in the order of 5 second. With higher frequency stimulation 50 Hz or more, neurotransmitter depletion can result in failure to initiate depolarization of the muscle fiber membrane. The muscle fiber response to constant frequency stimulation can also diminish because of reduced spread of the action potential over to the muscle fiber membrane. It has been observed if skeletal muscle is fatigued rapidly by stimulation at 100 Hz for 10 seconds and then the stimulation frequency is decreased to 20 Hz, without any rest period, there is a sudden partial recovery of force output. This recoverable loss of force is given the name, high frequency fatigue. The effect is thought to be due to changes in the inner fiber and T-tubule cation K plus and Na plus concentrations. Like neurotransmitter depletion, high frequency fatigue is unlikely to occur with voluntary contractions but is likely at frequencies typically used in transcutaneous stimulation 50 Hz or higher. Fatigue can also occur within the muscle fiber as a result of metabolic changes and changes in ion concentrations. Factors include inadequate supply of oxygen, glucose depletion and accumulation of metabolic byproducts including hydrogen ions within the muscle fiber. Variation in the concentrations of free and bound calcium ions Ca2 plus in the cytoplasm can also play a part. The relative contribution of these factors to electrically induced muscle fatigue is not completely understood and analysis is complicated because the relative contributions depend on the particular stimulus parameters used. Whether fatigue induced by electrical stimulation is detrimental to muscle strengthening is arguable. One argument is that a fatigued fiber has dropped out so there is no benefit to be gained by further stimulation, hence fatigue is to be avoided. The counter-argument is that strengthening will occur only if the muscle fiber is worked to its fatigue limit. The answer seems to be that fatigue results in strengthening but only if it is the muscle fiber which fatigues. Fatigue can result from neurotransmitter depletion or propagation failure, in which case the muscle fibers is not activated and is not strengthened. If fatigue occurs within the muscle fiber, cellular processes are triggered which results in strengthening. In graded voluntary constructions, fatigue-resistant muscle fibers are preferentially recruited for low contractile forces. Increased muscle force is achieved partly by increasing the firing frequency of the activated motor units and partly by recruiting more motor units. Fatigue-resistant motor units are small, the innervating fibers have a small diameter and the number of muscle fibers per motor unit is small. So recruitment of fatigue-resistant fibers produces low increments in muscle force which can be finely graded to produce a smooth, continuous increase. Greatest force is achieved by the additional recruitment of fast twitch, fast fatigue motor units. Fast fatigue motor units are large, 
The innervating fibers have a large diameter and the number of muscle fibers per motor unit is high. Thus recruitment of fast fatigue fiber produces very large increases in muscle force but the force increase cannot be sustained. Normal physiological recruitment of motor units is thus an efficient process. Energy efficient, fatigue resistant motor units are recruited first and fast twitch. Fast fatigue fibers are kept in reserve as a means to produce shorter duration, unsustainably high forces. As noted previously, the electrical stimulation, recruitment depends on the proximity of nerve fibers to the electrodes and the nerve fiber diameter. This means that in an electrically induced contraction, there will be a disproportionate recruitment of large diameter fast fatigue fibers and consequently a rapid rate of fatigue. The problem is compounded by the fact that the fusion frequency of fast fatigue fibers so the stimulation frequency must be high if a smooth, tetanic contractio is to be produced. Force production and fatigue. It might be thought that if higher force is produced by higher electrical stimulation, the rate of fatigue would be higher. It is certainly true that with voluntary contractions, the higher the force produced, the greater the rate of fatigue. This is not the case with electrically induced contractions. Higher intensity to electrical stimulation recruits more of the smaller diameter nerve fibers innervating fatigue resistant muscle fibers as well as recruiting more deeply located larger diameter fibers. The net effect is little change in the fatigue rate at higher stimulation intensities. Voluntary contraction of muscle. During voluntary contractions the firing of motor neurons is asynchronous and this produces a smooth muscle contraction. The force of a contraction is graded, in general, by an increase in 1 the number of motor units recruited, spatial summation and 2 the frequency of nerve action potentials, temporary summation. At low force levels, force increases are produced by recruiting more muscle fibers and the motor units recruited are fatigue resistant. Only at high force levels are fast fatigue fibers recruited. The number of motor units recruited is most relevant in the low force stages of contraction. Firing frequency is also used to increase muscle force and this becomes more important at high force levels. The force of contraction changes quite markedly in the frequency range 5 to 20 Hz in this example.